Hello, everyone, and welcome to our first innovation, inclusive, inclusive innovation economy conversation for the year. I am really excited um, about getting back to our monthly conversations. The goals of this idea and action put together to help us build an inclusive economy um, is one that we started last year. And we wanted to really build bridges to the diverse eco ecosystem and groups right here in Massachusetts that are driving change. We convened for the first time, Mayor Janey, Mayor Lightfoot and Mayor Bree, all historic elections and women leading cities who were able to talk about how cities can play a role in supporting diverse innovation economies. And this year, we're going to dive deeper into some specific economy and industries. We want to fully understand what the life sciences um, are doing and how we can help here in Massachusetts. Next month, we'll be talking about gaming and we're gonna end the year in December with a conversation about arts and the creative economy. So I thank you for joining us and for being our first this year with the Inclusive Innovation Economy conversation focusing on life sciences and developing talent. Boston and our surrounding areas have one of the largest life sciences ecosystems in the world. Some say number one, I would say number one. We have had 18 of the top biopharma organizations and we also are a highly educated crew, um, still number one with the number of residents that hold degrees. Yet there are those still who are excluded. And as we know, the entry to any economy, a lot of times is working in it. And so we wanna explore today, what is the human capital needed to keep our ecosystems growing here in Massachusetts? And how can we make sure everyone in the city is able to rise with this rising tide. So we're talking to experts who are in many facets of building this diverse workforce pipeline for life sciences. So let me introduce them. First, we have Ken Turner, who is the president and CEO of Massachusetts Life Science Center, an economic and, and investment agency dedicated to supporting the growth and development of life sciences in Massachusetts. He directs and oversees the center's operations, investment, strategies, programs, and partnerships. Ken previously served as the Director of Diversity and Inclusion and Compliance for MassCorp, which we could do a whole nother conversation, Ken, because the MassCorp goals are something that are standards and something um, that, that's a point of pride, I think, for where we're heading in this city. Dr. Aisha Francis, is the president and CEO of the Benjamin Franklin Institute of Technology, making her the first female president of the college's more than 100 year history. Dr. Francis was previously the college's CEO and she currently oversees the day-to-day -day operations of college management of the senior leadership team and plays a critical role in advancing the mission of the college. Dr. Francis is an award-winning nonprofit leader and educator with broad experience in strategic planning, philanthropy, board relations, marketing, and communications. She believes in the ability of effective organizations and well-supported individuals to transform underserved communities for the better, which is her life's work. Counselor Julia Mejia is one of four Boston City Councils at large. She was elected in 2019 as the first Afro-Latina on the Boston City Council. When she was five, she immigrated from the Dominican Republic to Dorchester, where she lives now with her daughter. Counselor Mejia grew up in Boston Public Schools, and because of this, education is an important part of the work she does in, in the city of Boston. Driven by a lifelong pursuit of justice and equity, Counselor Mejia has created countless opportunities for others to step in their power and advocate for power for a positive change as a community organizer and now as a Boston City Councilor. So welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thanks for having us. So Ken, truth be told, 
I was in the streets and folks were talking about Ken's doing this strategy, Ken's doing this strategy. So we want to start with you. And if you can just help us, you know, understand this overall strategy for the life sciences that you're looking at and why there is this concern around the qualified work. Certainly, thank. So, first off, thank you for inviting me to join the uh, the panel this afternoon uh, and to have this discussion. You know, around diversity, equity, inclusion, and as it applies to the life sciences, I think it's an incredibly important topic uh, and one that is in the forefront of my mind each and every day as I come to work. Uh, you know, look, I'm I'm proud. You know, to to be at the helm of an organization that has helped to build uh, a robust uh, ecosystem such that Massachusetts is in effect the preeminent leader in the life sciences space, uh, not only here in the nation, but globally. I mean, by almost any metric you can think of, whether we are looking at, you know, VC dollars per capita, NIH investment dollars, uh, into research on a per capita basis, uh, if we were to look at the you know, footprint of biopharma uh, global companies, you know, the top 25 globally, we have, I think, 18 or 19 uh, here that have a footprint in the Commonwealth. Um, if we were to look at the number of uh, graduates uh, in any given year that go into the life sciences, we have more here in the Commonwealth than any other state. Um, we look at our educated workforce. We have more advanced degrees and more PhDs than any state in the union. And I could go on and on and on and on. You know, um, now having said that, 10 months into my job, I've been spending a good bit of time um, over the past 10 months getting out as often as I can, visiting with industry partners, academia, non for profits, research institutions, really wanting to get my understanding of the ecosystem. Uh, in, a, in an intimate way. And, and my style is, I call it listening towards, get out and meet people, look them in the eye, shake their hands and sit down, have a cup of tea and introduce yourself and, and, and really learn about their company, where they wanna go in the future, how can we be supportive in government of, of those plans, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And one thing that's become really clear to me over the course of those conversations is that while we have enjoyed uh, a tremendous amount of success in this life science ecosystem, I think of it as that success is not even. And what I mean by that is there are, there are many things still left for us to do, right? The center's been around since 2008. So we're about 13, 14 years old. It was born out of what was called the Mass Life Sciences Initiative that was uh, launched uh, under the Patrick administration. Uh, and in fairness to Governor Patrick was, you know, his direct vision, right? Uh, and then with, you know, the support of the legislature funded for a decade uh, with a billion dollars. And then in 2018, uh, you know, the legislature has seen fit um, um, under the leadership of the Baker Polito administration uh, to, pass a continuing resolution uh, or reauthorization as it's called in the business, which provides for another $623 million in funding. So Massachusetts has put forth over a billion and a half dollars of input into the life science ecosystem. Um, so a serious investment, right? That says we're serious about wanting to be a leader in the space and we're gonna put our money where our mouth is. And again, all of that's well and good, and I can share statistics, you know, to the cows comes home about, you know, how great we are. But the reality right, is- folks can Google that part. <laughs> yep, 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 you can Google that part and you can even find me saying it. So, you know, no problem. Because that's my job, that's part of my job, right? Is to tout the success of the state. But the reality is there's still a lot of work to do. You know, so let's start with, you know, one friction point for me. I call it regionality. And what I mean by that is, you know, the life science success story, as I think of it, is largely concentrated in the greater Boston Cambridge area because that's where the R&D footprint is. You know, that's where the heavy research is being done by these leading companies that are, you know, producing vaccines that are like, you know, taking us out of COVID, like Moderna, 
our, our visor, our J and J. And by the way, all three of those companies are here in Massachusetts, right? They have a footprint here in Massachusetts. Moderna was born here in Massachusetts with an investment from a life science center. You know, talk about a success story, right? But anyway, I digress. Uh, but when I think about how do we flow that success out beyond the greater Boston, Cambridge area, say, if I were to draw a radius on the map, say, uh, you know, an hour's drive to an hour and 15 minutes or so, how do I get beyond that? How do I get to Worcester and Springfield and Western Mass to Pittsfield and to Lee, or to the North Shore, to Beverly and to Gloucester, or to the Middlesex Valley, or out to Lawrence or Lowell? To me, that's the opportunity, right, that's in front of us. As we think about coming out of COVID and putting people back to work, reskilling, upscaling, et cetera, et cetera, I think we've got this, sorry about that. Forgot to turn all my phones off. Uh, let's do that. Somewhere there's another one ringing. So I got too many phones. Um, that's okay, Ken. That's okay. You were saying around so, upskilling and yeah, so upskilling and 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 rescaling. I think we've got an opportunity to really do to not only meet the needs of the moment, but to actually really do some good. You know, if I go back to my mass port days and put on my D E and ha D E and I hat, I'm thinking, what if we can take people who don't participate in the life sciences? folks from underrepresented neighborhoods, which is code for people of color, right? People who aren't necessarily, you know, solidly in the middle class, folks who are in neighborhoods like Dorchester, Mattapan, or Roxbury, for example. How do we bring these people into this economy that is so robust and growing and is so hot and on fire? And so I've been talking with companies, and in fact, in fact, just this morning met with MassBio's board to present the strategic framework to them and have a conversation with them about it. So we're getting it hot, uh, hot off the press. Literally hot off the press. This is my second time today talking about it publicly. But, I, but, but, the re, but my thinking is if we double down and really focus on biomanufacturing as an entry point, and what I mean by that is there is, there is a certain set of jobs and we'll classify them broadly as biomanufacturing technician, right? Which is, you know, kind of a, a hypernym, if you will, but, but let's just leave it at that. Those jobs, quote unquote, entry-level jobs, pay anywhere from 50 to 60 to $70,000 starting with benefits, with educational training, with upward mobility, and you go from a job to a career in the life sciences, but it requires training. And Aisha knows this because she and I have been having right, a conversation. I was going to say, and I'm going to be forth. bringing her as in, in a second as well to talk about that. Are going to play a critical part in this. And so we've got to figure out how the colleges, the community colleges, the non for profits like the Genomics Institute in Gloucester, or Just to Start in Cambridge, or Mass Bio Ed's apprenticeship program, which I just helped sponsor and kick off, I think either this week or last week when I when I did their remarks. So we've got to we've got to figure out these pipelines of training and how to a evaluate the efficacies of those pipelines. Think about what the cost per output is. I, so I think there ought to be some metrics around cost. I mean, you know, hey, if it's costing me twenty two to twenty three thousand dollars per student, well, that's a problem, right? But if we can scale it up and instead of doing 70 students a year, you're doing 700 students a year, then that's the need that we need to meet. But oh, by the way, what if those students were people of color and women and coming from neighborhoods where people could benefit from solidly middle class jobs? So that's what we're working on. That's a central part of the strategy Love uh, this. That, that, that we unveiled this morning and that we're yeah, going to be yeah. working on for the next you know couple of months to come. So stay tuned. There's 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 a lot of work to be done, but I'm very, very excited about, I think, where we're going to end up. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Ken, you know, we can all follow it and um, and see what's happening. And I think it's a great entry point to bring in um, Aisha Francis, who is holding a, you know, a part of this pipeline and holding it well and also moving to Roxbury, um, something I'm, I'm very excited about as a Roxbury resident. Um, but, you know, we hear this conversation around jobs and trainings and, you know, these numbers, right? 
scaling to 700. And, you know, one of the things I, um, you know, I think about in that, that we talk about is, you know, how do we move from these numbers to like Malia Lazu getting one of these jobs and starting my career? And can you talk to us about, you know, what it means to go from 700 jobs to 700 W-2s or, you know, whatever the, the number is? And and what are some of the, the pipeline problems that, that you're solving for actively? Well, thank you for that question. And I think it's, um, we have the benefit of, an organization like the Mass Life Sciences Center and Mass Bio and others that are uh, producing a lot of data and uh, really supporting this ecosystem economically. I want to pick up on a few things. So Benjamin Franklin Institute of Technology, just to ground folks, we are a technical and trade college. We are building an associate's degree in biotechnology, uh, particularly in manufacturing. And what that means as an accredited college, we're accredited by the same people that accredit MIT and, and other institutions, is that you have to do that in a methodical way uh, with industry input um, and with you know, a team of experts so that our responsibility is to make sure that people are being trained for industry roles that actually exist to your point, Malia, right? And what has happened in the biotech space is you could go right now and look at jobs with the terms technician in them, which technically should be roles that are available with an associate's or a certificate degree. And they all say bachelor's degree required, or I would say 95% of them do. So what we have, I think, you know, it's not only in Massachusetts, but particularly in Massachusetts, because to Ken's point, we do have this high concentration of people with advanced degrees and PhDs. Folks have been choosy and there is degree inflation and degree discrimination at play. And so we have to work um, from, from two angles. We're building our program at the same time that we're working directly with uh, biotech companies to say, you have to change your requirements in order. If you're feeling these pain points, right, you can't find people or the people you do find stay for short amounts of time, then there's a way in which systems have been set up to make it more difficult for individuals to find their way into industries. And so, so that's one thing we're working on and, and will help get human beings in the roles that are open and available. Secondly, you know, to this point about regionality, you know, what we're missing in, in, our, in the Boston area is there's a, a disconnect between, uh, you know, in geographically between Boston Medical Center and then the corridor, there was a life sciences corridor that you could kind of connect the dots to, um, you know, the, the Fenway area into the Longwood Medical Center and then go from there uh, to, to um, Cambridge. And that missing center is Nubian Square and Newmarket. And it leapfrogs, you know, the, the roles leapfrog, the, the training opportunities in biotech leapfrog. And so what, what our goal is, is to center skills training in life sciences, you know, in an area where, you know, many people are working low wage jobs with little potential for growth because skills training can be expensive and hard to find. And we know it might seem really easy. Oh, it's just a mile or just a few miles away. We know those few miles take someone 30 minutes on mass transit or more. It's, it's actually inconvenient. So we're addressing that hurdle by making the commitment to offer workforce training um, in the life sciences, right in the community in, in Nubian Square, uh, where there are many people who are underemployed employed and untapped talent. And that will make post-secondary education more accessible, right there in neighborhoods where there's high unemployment, low income, and you know, lower than ideal education attainment. So I think you know, those are the two things that I would mention is one, you know, working to make sure that there's um, the public will and the private will to release the minimum requirements of, of a bachelor's degree. Uh, for roles that don't really need it, and then placing job training where there's dense availability of workers who can get um, upskilled and, and reskilled. 
Absolutely. Aisha, you know, I'm so glad you talked about degree inflation because I think it's something that all industries, right, are are now looking at and seeing, um, you know, where, um, what, what is the education needed that can start? And then to Ken's point, if people can be supported and, you know, going to higher education, if that's something they so choose, they can even have those opportunities within the companies that they work for, right? To continue certifications and, and to continue education and, and things like that. It's really about getting in, right? Once people are in, they do the work to keep their jobs, right? This is America. We, we got to have a job. So, um, you know, I think that understanding that there's some structural um, issues here, right? That that can actually make a a moat, if you will, between talent, right? Like we do have talent, um, but the criteria set is um, is not allowing that talent to be chosen. Um, Councilor Mejia, you know your leadership on workforce development, you know, is something that you take very passionately, and I know your love for you know Madison Park, and you know you talk about in your bio that you're a product of BPS, right? Um, Dorchester girl, um, you know, from the the streets to the halls of, of City Hall, right? From Dorchester to Government Center, um, which must feel like a huge leap sometimes that as you advocate for Boston Public School children, um, you know, we know that 86%, I think was the last statistic of Boston Public School children are children of color. You know, we, we know the struggles that we've had. We, you know, don't necessarily have an elected school committee, right? But can you help us understand what the city's role in workforce development and life sciences in particular um, is and you know what this city can do to as these gaps appear, you know that that are that you're hearing about how the city can maybe play a role in in helping close them. Thank you, first of all, thank you so very much um, for inviting me to be here. I feel like incredibly in awe of your two other panelists um, and encouraged really by the work that already has. Um, that you all are doing to move the conversation forward. Um, so I, I think it's important to first, I, I always like to kind of set the table, if you will. Um, this is a conversation that when we think about the life sciences, a lot of young people are, uh, you know, sometimes people have to Google, what, what, what does life science mean, right? So like just really helping people understand. Um, I, and I'm an adult and I was like, let me Google this before I get up in here so that I know what I'm talking about, right? So I think that in terms of level setting, it's really important that unless you grew up in an environment where this was part of the dinner table or that you have people in your family that are in these particular roles or have cousins that are, then this is, this is always gonna feel something like that it's out of reach, right? So I think that there's some intentionality in terms of like the exposure um, that we can provide our Boston Public School students uh, with in early stages, right? So let's not even just wait for 11th and 12th, let's really start talking about this in middle school as a viable career when you're in, in your science classrooms, right? I, I think that it's also really important to note that in our Boston Public Schools in particular, there's some schools that don't even have science labs. And so when we're thinking about building this pipeline, we also have to really be super mindful that the city needs to do a better job and making sure that we're preparing students to be able to compete um, in these competitive fields, right? And so some of it is just access to information and understanding what the role, what, what job opportunities exist. But then the other piece of it is having the tools um, in your schools to really be able to expose students to what this looks like. I remember when I was in high school and, um, and career explorations is not something that you, you hear a lot about in Boston public schools. You know, I talk about the fact that I was almost 20 by the time I graduated, I had dropped out and um, I was selling shoes at working at a shoe store and cleaning offices with my mom and going to college was not even on my radar until Liz Walker, who's the first African-American anchor, news anchor in the state of Massachusetts, shared her story at my high school and, in, and interrupted my entire cycle of poverty. So I say all of this is that if you see it, then you can be it. So there needs to be more exposure and intentionality around the city and how do we create this pipeline and start planting these seeds earlier. So I think that that's a role that Boston Public Schools can play. And the other piece is for the city to really invest in state-of-the-art um, 
labs uh, so that young people can really experiment. When I was in high school, I remember dissecting a frog and I was like, ew, this is nasty. What would it, why, why they got me doing this? Like, so you have to learn these things, but there's right now, we don't have that in our Boston public schools. Like, so that is a big gap that we need um, to fill. And then when we talk about the workforce and especially in the city of Boston, I find it very offensive when I hear um, during our public hearings around talent that we don't have it. You can't say to me that we do not have black and brown talent and women. Like that is offensive when you say that that's one of the reasons why you're fa failing to reach your um, diversity goals. And I think that there needs to be more accountability um, and enforcement and transparency, uh, really, if we're really seriously about moving this conversation forward and holding ourselves accountable um, to that work. And I'm incredibly encouraged by having the life sciences in Nubian Square because to um, Aisha's point, uh, when when it's right in our neighborhoods, it's so much easier to for us to get to work, if you will, right? Um, and I think it's and you and to your point, Counselor, you you know you can be it. You see people doing it, right? I mean, I I always loved that. Um, you know, whether it was Richard Pryor or Muhammad Ali, right? I think both of them like went to Africa and like talked about like Muhammad Ali was talking about. We got pilots. We got this. We got that. Right? Like. If you don't see it, as you said, you you can't be it. Yeah, and so having the life sciences and 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 that innovation uh, feel there, right? I, I think it's going to change it, and it's going to feel more accessible because there's one thing around diversity and inclusion, but then there's also this piece around accessibility. And so if you can get to it, um, then you'll you'll see it more clearly as as a viable opportunity um, for you to explore. So I think that there's all of those things go hand in hand and the city needs to be more intentional about when people are going to build in our neighborhoods. When we look at what's happening in Alston and Brighton um, and in other parts of the city is what are the community benefits that are gonna come along with that? Um, it's not just about scholarship, right. but how intentional are we going to be about creating apprentice um, programs for, for students to be right. able Ken's to- Ken's gonna have to mass port the life sciences. Ken, you're gonna have to mass port um, the life sciences, but I think to, to um, you know, Councilor Mejia's point, um, there is going to have to be some tools of accountability, right? There is going to have to be some teeth that come with the ask and the city, um, you know, is really the only ones, right? Like, yes, we can protest, right? Communities can try to hold accountability, but when it comes to private development, especially, right, that there's very few places um, around to hold people accountable. Um, Ken, I'd love to jump back to you and I wanna ask people if you have questions, feel free to, to throw them in the chat. Um, you know, that education, 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 right? We, we hear about it all the time. Um, and, you know, I mean, I, I can always go one of two ways, right? Like I know very successful people who have high school educations, right? Um, college changed my life, right? When when the counselor talks about getting out of poverty, it was college, right? For me that that let me, um, you know, jump uh, jump above my mother, right? Um, in, in a way. And so can you talk us, talk us through around, you know, a, um, Aisha talks about this inflation and associates and certificate programs. You know, is it that we have the talent, um, but the the paper, the, it, it just your paper ain't no good here. Is, is that sort of what's happening? That's that's part of the it, you know you know that's part of it. it it's a it's a very complicated issue. Uh, you know, I think it starts with first off, you know, it's the it, it's it's understanding the demand. I think you got to start there, right? So, and what, what do I mean by that? Um, if I'm talking to uh, a Merck or an, or, or an EMD, you know, um, um, or uh, Bayer or J&J &J or Vertex or Ginkgo Bioworks or whatever, and you use the word, you know, back to the word, you know, biomanufacturing technician, it's a very different beast from company to company to company. Um, in one case, um, the training needed to, per, you know, to have a person in effect on the manufacturing floor contributing to the output of that company can be only three weeks, literally only three weeks training. 
with no certificate or anything, just three weeks training. And you just need a smart person who shows up on time and has a good work ethic and has a brain, can follow SOPs, et cetera, et cetera. On the other end of that spectrum, I've got programs where people are spending two years or two and a half years in a community college training uh, to come out with a you know certificate in, again, biomanufacturing. But that's a very different individual in terms of the not just the scope of their training, but obviously the amount of skills and experience that they have. So my intention is we're going to convene a working group. Um, I am co-hosting a summit on this topic of bridging the gap between the demand and the supply with Marcelo, the chancellor at UMass Boston. Uh, we met this summer when I was out on my listening tour and we agreed on the spot that we wanted to work together. So we're gonna co-host the summit the first week of November. So it's only a few weeks away. And it's gonna bring industry partners along with the supply, which will be the universities, community colleges, non-for-profits, training institutions, et cetera. And it's gonna be a day of, let's talk about what the issues are so we have a good handle on what we need to solve for. And then I'm, then I'm going to announce at the end of that summit, so I'm kind of giving away my own announcement, so that, everyone, so, yes, shh, you didn't hear it here. We're going to convene a, a working group. And so that's the power of the center is that we can bring erstwhile competitors together like a Vertex or a Moderna or J&J and, J and bring them all in the same room and say, we have a common problem. Let's work on solving. It. And so every one of my industry partners that I've spoken with, I've made it known to them that I'm going to need their help and their money. So I made it clear too, because this is not going to be all on the back of the government, uh, because I'm in effect trying to solve your problem. So you need to pony <laughs> up and have skin in the game. And so we are going to convene a working group. Um, uh, it's going to be co-chaired by an industry partner, which will be revealed at the summit. And it's going to be uh, also co-chaired by Mass Bio. I just, you know, I just spoke with Joe Bancari in Kendall uh, a couple of days ago, and then I was with their board this morning. So, and our whole thing is gonna be, let's start with the demand. Let's go literally company by company, define exactly what your needs are. And I want them to commit to how many jobs are you also gonna commit to on an annual basis going forward so we can forecast. Cause this is not about, again, guessing how we're going to do this or going off and building a training program and then finding out people graduate and can't get a job. Nope, nope, we're not gonna play that game. It's gonna be, you're gonna tell me exactly what you need, Millipore, Sigma, Vertex, Jinko Bioworks. Let's, defend those, let's define those skills discreetly, company by company, number of jobs and region. Then on the other side, when you're looking at the Aishas of the world, and the non-for-profits like the Genomics Institute, which has a beautiful program, or Middlesex Community College, which has a great biomanufacturing program, or Mass Bay, or you know, mm -hmm. Just to Start in Cambridge, which has a great training program. Let's look at all these different programs. Again, let's put some metrics right. around what we want to measure. You know, how much does it cost per student? What's your throughput? Is it scalable? Is it also syndicatable so that we can look at it, you know, further out in regions? So yep, let's, come up, yep. let's come up with that criteria and then That's we right. make them up, right? Ken, I, think, up. I think the counselor wants to jump in here. So I just want to give sure. her a chance to jump in. Yeah. So Ken, I, I, I'm just uh, volunteering myself to uh, join yep. that table because I want to be at all the tables that are being. That's fine. We'll, 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 we'll reach out to you and invite oh. you to be part of, to, 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 to be part of the group because I need all the help I can get to get this right. Yeah, so so that and also we um, secured to Malia's question earlier in terms of what the city can do. Um, through our advocacy in our office, we were able to create a new line item in the budget that has never existed before. Yeah. And it's a workforce development initiative yeah. for jobs for 19 to 24 year olds, right? So the yeah. city um, put out $800,000. And um, to your point, 
you know, we're looking for partners to match, right? Because I, I know that the only way that we're going to grow this is if everyone understands the role that they have to play to invest in right. these initiatives, right? Um, right. And so our goal is to target students who are graduating from Madison Park, um, young mm -hmm. people who are transitioning out of DYS mm -hmm. uh, um, and the foster care system, and as mm -hmm. well as um, alternative high schools, like non-traditional learners. Sure. Sure. And, and right. so, um, so that is one of our main focuses. And I know 300 of it was the budget and then some of it was just for, from some of the federal grants that we mm -hmm. um, are receiving. But my hope is, is that through partnerships that we can create a pipeline where we're preparing young people to explore careers that they probably wouldn't have ever considered um, and do so in a way that is beneficial to them so it's not just the That's job right. training um the no the, but there's an actual pipeline yeah, to the job to the job and there's also um a, a, a salary that comes with it so the city initially right. wanted to train like 150 young people to go through this training program and i said no i don't want to water it down what i want to do is i want to be more targeted i would rather have 25 young people five from each of the different cohorts that we want to target do super uh, focused work with them and provide mm -hmm. them a higher cost of living, you know, uh, sure. salary. Sure. So then that way it becomes right. more beneficial to them. So we're still going back and forth with the administration because obviously, even though I'm the one who got that money, it's the administration that gets to dictate how it really gets rolled out. So we're at the table really trying to push for something. But my hope is, is that through this initiative, Ken, we can potentially mm -hmm. identify one or two young people that could participate um, in some pipeline with you, Aisha, through your um, uh, school as well. I just think yes. that there's a lot of ways to connect here. To, well, to and connect this is lot. what the pipeline is about, right? It's like we have the segments. But what are, and I, you know, I'm not a pipe fitter, so I'm not sure what the segments that connect pipes are called, right? But a lot of times that's where the breakdown is, right? And I know there was a question in the chat and Aisha, I want to, you know, ask you to respond to some of this conversation sure. and also take a first crack at one of the questions that, you know, talks about what groups um, do, uh -huh. you know, are, are doing this well. I mean, BFIT is one that, that that's why we're highlighting, right? And the work that the ecosystem is doing. Um, yeah. But please um, take the floor for a couple of minutes and, and address that question. Sure. So I think, you know, to Councilor Mejia's points, there is uh, an expectation around preparedness that sometimes comes with the corporate sector. And, you know, you know at, at Benjamin Franklin Institute and some of the other um, you know, just to start that you mentioned, Ken, there's a different shift, which is, mm -hmm. you know, the focus is, yes, you need to be ready as a student, as a learner, adult learner, or what have you, but institutions have to be ready to, to start with the basics and receive and, and build folks up in a way that's asset-based, you know, and not deficit-focused, and that has a lot to do with people's success in training programs is how you approach it. And there's some cultural competency there that uh, can be overlooked with well-intentioned organizations that don't have um, the trust and experience and expertise working with folks from uh, first generation households, whether that first generation of college, first generation in this country, um, or who have been court involved, or who are in recovery, or who have been in, in the um, foster care system. Those are all complicated and complicating factors when you are presented with an educational opportunity. And so I think, you know, it can't be overstated that there's work to be done in the corporate sector and in the, the um, post-secondary education sector as well to make sure that we're building environments that are, are you know, ready um, and cultures that are ready to be, um, you know, to shift and to, and to change so that people can, can be successful. And there's, that's to me, Ken, one of the measures of success as well is the retention rate, right? What is the employee retention rate? What is your trainee retention yep. rate? Like don't and that's bring that into people culture. in. And yep. that's when culture you know, yep. plays such a critical role, yes. right? We I hired, like, we hired right. this one person and they didn't work out. I, okay, well, maybe that was, there was something about your approach, you mm -hmm. know, that- Well, that and I, I, I wanna just stop there to really get to that point um, and have all of you respond, you know, counselor, even in, you know, what you hope to do with this is, 
you know, I, I feel like we're always talking about what we have to do, the certifications we have to get, how we have to change. We have to be in the right rooms in the right times. And, you know, we have to be prepared, you know, from starting from kindergarten and, and all that's true. Sure. But there's also the side that just does it. I mean, hidden figures should have put it proven the point, right? Like, I mean, I, I guess like there's also like the side that just seems to not be able to find talent and seems to just wring their hands. And so, you know, I'd like to actually spend a couple of minutes and I know where we're getting to close, but I think, you know, someone asked what can MIT do to support institutions like yours, Ken and Aisha, and, you know, to support issues like this. And so I want to sort of focus on, you know, I mean, we're at one of the most elite institutions in the world, right? Um, we're, you know, we're on our own inclusive journey, right? Um, you know, and we, we have a lot to improve. So can we, you know, talk about maybe, um, you know, what, what, what that corporate side, you know, how we talk about those cultural competencies and Ken, I'd love to start with you and then we'll do Aisha sure. and then Counselor um, Mejia, I'd love for you to also focus on, you know, anything that you hear, but also how can institutions like MIT support cities? Because sometimes I think, you know, we forget that you could, that you all could use our help as well. So Ken, let's start with you. Let, let, let's talk about the- no, no, Happy to do that. So so let me let me just throw out, you know, another data point so that folks are aware. So Alan Gerber, who is the provost of Harvard and your provost, um, uh, actually co-chair a biomanufacturing, uh, uh, you know, we, we'll call it a council for lack of a better, better word. In fact, I just met with them a couple of weeks ago along with Secretary Keneally and the undersecretary of, uh, uh, housing and, edu uh, uh, and economic development, Mark Fuller, and 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 in that group, uh, you know who you know who are having a very robust discussion about these issues, were literally the leaders uh, in the science space in healthcare uh, across uh, 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 across the state. Uh, so uh, so I say that to say this: uh, don't think that MIT is not playing a role because MIT is playing a role. Um, and, and helping us think this through. And so is Harvard, uh, you know, and, and institutions like that. Well, we're um, better. Go on, Ken. No, I'm so, joking. <laughs> so, so just want to, you know, give credit where credit's due. And, 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 and what's encouraging to me is there are a lot of disparate groups having this same conversation, right? Uh, you know, whether I'm talking to the board of Mass Bio, whether I'm talking to the, you know, the, 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 the biomanufacturing you know, workforce task force that I just talked about that's formed by Alan Gerber and your provost, uh, whether I'm talking even internally to the administration, when I'm talking to Secretary Keneally and his staff, whether I'm talking to Secretary Acosta and Labor, or Secretary Pizer in education, this conversation is resonating out and out and out. And what that tells me is this is a central problem that everybody gets that's and right. understands. Uh, and by God, you know, if we if we can't meet the demand today uh, and we can't, then how are we going to meet the demand of the future when we know that right now the forecast is we're, you know, you know give you, you know, some sense of scope. Uh, the life sciences sector uh, has created about 89 to 90,000 jobs here in Massachusetts that could be classified as life sciences. Now, obviously, all of those are not biomanufacturing jobs. About 10, I think, percent or so of those are biomanufacturing jobs. What I'd like to see is to see us expand that category, which means we have to have more biomanufacturing done here in the state, which is a whole nother strategy that we mm -hmm, got to work on, mm -hmm. right? Because now you're talking about scaling up companies. We're talking about getting the big biofarmers to produce their products here rather than right. in North Carolina. Hey, we got factories or, in Lawrence. Or, or, we got factories whatever. in Lowell. Right, back and that to goes your back point. to the regionality. You know, you, you know, that's exactly right. That goes back to the regionality piece that I want to work on. Thank right, you. is we can we can build plants in places like Lowell and Lawrence and the North Shore and Middle uh, Massachusetts or Western Massachusetts far cheaply than we can here in the Boston Cambridge area. That's right. And so that's part of that. Right, it's, it's, around, it's part of what around, the other side has to do. Which is, Aisha. which is the industry side. Now, having said that. You know, we're now looking to add another 40,000 jobs by 2024. 
So, you know, it clearly says we've got to we've got to really get serious about this if we're going to meet that demand. And so right. and I think it sounds all, like I think I, I think that all of us feel that sense of urgency and responsibility around it. The 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 unique opportunity, though, as a result of covid is that we are in this incredibly unusual moment where there is quite a ro quite a robust amount of funding both at the state level and at the federal level. And that's not normally the case. I, I always think about it simply as you normally have a bunch of great ideas and no money, but we're in a, we're in a moment where quite frankly, we're between you know, Build Back Better and ARPA funding and, and, and our state coffers in terms of the amount of revenue that we took in versus forecast that we've got, I was just in a meeting the other day, we got about 110, $120 million right now that folks are saying, raise your hand and tell me how you want to spend this. And and there's and so, nothing, Ken, I'm sorry, just because I yeah, know we're, we're getting yeah. to time. So I, ju I just want to pause on that point because I think there's nothing that, you know, and, and as a feel of an organizer, when I hear that there's a bunch of money to spend because I know trickle down doesn't work, right? So I think this this strategy that you're doing is so important to make yeah. sure the money can actually get to the people yeah. like Aisha, like the organization you talked about in Cambridge, right? The people yeah. who are doing the actual right. work um, that, I mean, you you just hit the nail. We got money. It needs to be spent in the right yeah. places. Or we just we need to come up with not... creative ideas about how to that's make, this, right. how to make Th these that's pipelines right. So, work, right? Exactly. So Aisha, I'm going to kick it to you, um, sis, as we start wrapping up to, you know, talk about, um, you know, what places like MIT can do and anything else that you may want to say about the cultural competency. Absolutely. Well, I think that there is um, incredible, there are incredible resources in our, our larger institutions. Um, I know that the MIT has, you know, the MITES program and a lot of STEM programs in the K through 12 space. One of the things I think is important to do is to make those resources more transparent and more available to people who are across the river. Uh, and, and perhaps that's directly through BPS. Um, and, and I'm sure that there's some of that that already happens. So what I'm hearing and what I see is that, you know, there isn't as much awareness of um, the types of programs that are already available. And sometimes I get these, these SOS messages, you know, for especially, you know, I would say around April, May, you know, we have XYZ program and we have, you know, 10 slots left in it and there's no one in it. Like that shouldn't be, you know, there shouldn't be a mismatch between these enrichment opportunities and uh, especially ones that that have stipends that 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 accompany them, um, and the available uh, youth who we know need exposure. Uh, so I think there there's more work to be done there in concert with the city of Boston, which I understand. You know that MIT isn't in in Boston, but. I just, you know, there's got to be ways to make sure that more students who are here locally um, are, are getting into those programs and know about them. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Counselor. Yeah, so, you know, I'm always holding all universities accountable to ensuring that they are doing their due diligence to engage um, the communities. I, and, and while I do understand that there are some limitations, you know, I just want to talk a little bit about the cultural competency piece, especially in the workforce development area. Um, I, I did, I was a job specialist 150 years ago at Goodwill, and my job was to train women, specifically women who were transitioning out of DTA, um, which is also known as welfare. And I got a training manual that was like this big, and I asked permission to design my own um, training workforce development uh, manual because it wasn't culturally competent, right? And I think that I'm happy to say that that was in 20, 2012 and all of the women that graduated from that, that program are still employed. So if we're really serious about building pipelines, we have to make sure that we're literally meeting people where they're at and we're leading with their assets as Aisha you know, mentioned earlier that oftentimes we come into it, we come into a neighborhood and we see all the things that we don't have or that, you know, our people don't have. And we need to shift that mind frame and, and, and lead with the good 
and, and the skills that we already have and then cater um, opportunities that will um, help strengthen the workforce through our natural given talents. Like, so I think that there's a lot of work that needs to be done. And I think a role that MIT can play is, um, is opening up uh, their, their doors a bit more, um, not just in terms of just hosting events and, and activities, but really being a partner with the Boston Public Schools with BFIT and with other groups and other nonprofit organizations, like a meaningful partner, not one of those, I'm gonna parachute and get a whole bunch of data and use that data to, to design something else, but like a meaningful partner that is committed to a long-term relationship because that's the other piece of this work is that oftentimes, you know, we do a lot of short-term things, um, but those don't really lead to long sustainability. So I that's think right. that being more mindful of long-term relationships and commitments. Uh, yeah, to, to this. right. Understanding how long it takes us to, you know, to um to get to equity right um it's um it, it's a real real work you know counselor if i could just take your story for a second to talk about something that also happened at sloan very organically because i think organic relationship is mm -hmm. also a part of that and that's really what we're trying to do with these conversations you know is now folks know that they can reach out to ken right everyone can like linkedin every person that you see here if you have an idea right you can just get into the fabric and and you know become helpful, become of service, um, you know, or, or or find your place. But just to tell a quick story, um, Dr. Phil Budden and I did a um, seminar last year, and we brought in folks like um, Aisha. We brought in Kai Grant um, from Nubian, from Black Market and Nubian Square. Um, you know, a, a bunch of different folks that were talking locally. And from it, um, a couple of students helped like the LGBTQ chamber do some research. Um, but also a couple of students are now starting a small business clinic that's going to work with folks like Black Market, with Small Business Strong, um, you know, with different people who have already the black and brown pipelines um, of small businesses and be able to offer them services. These students want to partner with Northeastern's Law Clinic because they have a socially responsible law clinic. Um, you know, so I wanted to bring that out as an example as well as, you know, there's the institutional roles, but then there's just the things we do um, because we know we already know how to respond. And I want to encourage everyone here, you know, to to reach out like like these are now your friends. They're not just my friends. They're your friends, too. Um, and and that you can do that. And if anyone wants to put their email or, how you know, best way to get in contact with them in the chat, I see the counselor did that. Um, we just have a couple of minutes left. And so I'd like to go around and um, Aisha, we're gonna start with you and then go to Ken and then Councilor Mejia, you're gonna get the final word. And I just need one minute of closing so we can all look at the time and time ourselves accordingly. I just need um, at 120, um, at what is it? 129. Um, but if you can leave us with something that you're hopeful um, about um, when, when it comes to this change and you know, and a place that we want to lean into, that we want to amplify, as someone said, who's who's joining us. Sure. So I think I'm most excited about the fact that cross-sector collaboration is alive and well and is getting a shot in the arm. Uh, and, and that's what we have really seen here. You know, we have, um, you know, a, a college president a public official, an elected official, a citywide you know, elected official, and uh, the leader of a quasi um, public governmental agency in, in concert and really talking about how we can pull our resources, uh, whether those be financial resources or the intellectual capital or the, the people power to solve a challenge. And I think that's the kind of intentional work that it will require because there's no one sector, not the corporate, public or private, that's going to be able to tackle um, our mismatch in, in workforce development or the fact that the 40,000 jobs and that life sciences predicts that they're going to have in this region in just three 
three years, you know, that, that we're not yet at a point where we can even produce that, that talent. And so I think that's what's exciting about the conversation that we're having today is that we're at this moment of, of agreement where there's, you know, some coalescing that's happening. Thank you, Ken. You know, if, if uh, you know, if, if, my career in the military and the private sector and now the public sector has taught me anything is that success breeds success, right? And you mentioned the mass court model. And I go back to thinking about how we formed that innovative business diversity model, uh, which before did not exist, right? And so I look at this moment to Aisha's point and I think about, yes, there is this big issue in front of us, but man, do we have a great opportunity here? I mean, we have this terrific opportunity that between, as she put it, you know, government, both state and local, the private sector partners, our institutions of learning like hers, our non-for-profits all leaning in together. I, I just feel like I don't have the answer today and neither did I have the answer at the beginning of the process of developing the Massport model, but by God, we got there. And you get there because if you put smart people in the room and get the obstacles out of their way, you'll come up with creative answers. And so I know by success breeding success that you, know, you give me a year from now, let's have another conversation. Because I think right. we'll be in a very different place than where we are right now. I'm going to keep you to that, Ken. We're going to have it in a year. I look forward to celebrating. I, I, I Maybe we'll forward, even do it in person and clink glasses. I look forward to coming back. Yes. Counselor. Yeah. So I'm super encouraged. Just, let's just even take a moment to look in this Zoom. Who is facilitating? Who's leading the conversation, right? So that is also just an indicator of the fact that we already have arrived um, and we are leading the conversation in our own perspective spaces. And so this, this is what it looks like when we literally step to the side and let others lead. And so I'm incredibly encouraged just by being in this, in this um, space with you all today, which is what we need more of y'all, occupy every space. Um, and, and so that is, that is definitely something that I wanna leave us with is really the intentionality of recognizing that this moment in time really requires us to all lean in and that everybody um, working in different ways are, are part of that solution. Um, and so I think that if everyone is stepping up and sometimes stepping back when they need to, um, and, and if not getting the bullhorn to let them know that they got to uh, get out the way. Um, I think that that is how we're going to continue to build the workforce um, and also calling it out. You know, I, every time I walk into a room or into a Zoom, I always look to see who's in there and who's not. And also encourage folks to, to recognize that we need to make space for everybody. And I think that this is what it looks like when we're thinking about intentionality, when we're thinking about the workforce mm -hmm. and accountability is key. So I'm, I'm here for all of it. Thank you, thank you. Well, thank you everyone for joining us for an amazing conversation around the life sciences and developing talent and diversity. I think the main lesson is there's value everywhere and we need to know how to how to um, leverage it, right, and 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 mine it, if you will. I also want to give a shout out um, to the Science Club for Girls, um, and I want to suggest everyone. I think we're going to be putting their website in the chat. They are a great um, program that um, concentrates uh, with girls and young women. Um, and they're near and dear to my heart because I actually wanted to be a scientist. Um, and I feel like I got pushed off of the way because of all the things that we were talking about today. And so when I'm done with this career, the next one is going to be me digging up dinosaur bones if there's any left to dig up. Um, and girls have places in science, people of color invented science. I appreciate your time here. Join us in November where we're gonna take a deep dive into gaming. Thanks everyone, bye.